As we come very close to the hour mark, I got one final guest here who may yep. have one or two questions, and then we're going to kind of wrap it up. This turned out to be right. fun. The audience awesome. has, has really felt, uh, you know, that this has been a benefit. And so it was meant to be that uh, Mark Siegel here uh, kind of backed out. So, Org, um, thank you for joining. From, from my understanding, you're a geologist. You're also, you, you would not hold to creation. So uh, thank you for joining the open mic. Or if you want to give a brief uh, introduction into who you are for anybody yeah, who doesn't no know. And then if you had an objection or a question or a challenge to Kent, go ahead. Cool. Uh, yeah, I got a YouTube channel. It's uh, not as good as standings, but, you know, come check it out if you want to. Uh, I have a background in the geosciences, but I don't work in the field anymore. I wouldn't call myself a geologist. I just have a good background in it. Um, and my area of study when I went in graduate school was in uh, magnetics, rock magnetics. So I have a good knowledge about that stuff. And I wanted to ask a question to Kent because he might know a bit more. I've heard I, I like trees, uh, kind of grew up with Kent Hoven back in the day, right? Watching the videotapes and all that jazz. Um, and Kent, so my question revolves around the APWP, apparent polar wander path. Are you familiar with that at all? I didn't understand that at all. What was, around the H E W E? What is that? A P W P, apparent polar wander path. Do you know what that is? If not, I can ask something else. No, I don't. Never heard that abbreviation. The apparent what? Apparent polar wander path. Is the is the third word you saying wander? Like a wander, like like meander, walk around, wander. Wander. Yeah. The apparent the apparent wander path. What on earth is that? Oh, polar, yeah, I, right. Okay, Earth wobble. They were North Pole. Right. I, be, I believe it's there's a lot of in, indi, evidence to indicate the pole of the Earth while it's spinning has been wobbling some. I think that would be standard for any spinning object. But go ahead. There's too okay. many forces. There's things so, pulling again, on the Earth. Moon's gravity, and even Mars yeah, and yeah, Venus yeah. gravity pulling on us. So of course it's going to wobble some. Go ahead. So I guess my question might be something you're not familiar with, but one of the other many ways you can date uh, rocks, old age dating, is magnetic dating. And um, we use, uh, scientists can use the age of the rocks and the magnetic of them. You probably know the Atlantic Ocean, the magnetic stripping and that. Um, the apparent polar wander path goes back some 350 million years to the uh, Carboniferous. And I've always heard creationists say that the changes in the magnetic field captured in rocks was like a bunch of quick changes during the flood or something like that. But we have the old age Earth, Earth dating goes back well, well, well before what most creationists would say is the flood line in the geologic record. So I'm wondering how you could explain all these changes and flips in the magnetic field well past where these uh, floods supposedly happen in the rock record. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. I might be outside of your purview, but I don't no, know no. If you yeah. anything about that. I've never heard it called that, polar wandering, sure. Uh, I think the Bible clearly teaches when God created the earth, there was water under the crust of the earth. The Bible says God formed the earth to be inhabited. That's why he formed it, to be inhabited. Well, today... 3% of the surface of the Earth is habitable. 70% is underwater, a whole bunch more is ice caps and deserts. So 97% of the Earth's surface is not habitable. So what we are seeing is not at all what Adam and Eve saw. When they had lived on the Earth, there was water under the crust of the Earth. I'm just guessing the crust of the Earth was 10 miles thick, 10 to 20 miles thick. There was a layer of water under the crust of the Earth, and I'm a strong believer in what's called the canopy theory. There was a layer of a couple inches of ice above at 10 miles of atmosphere. So when God created the earth, it was perfect. People lived to be 900 years old. We cover all that in my video number two. So if the fountains of the deep broke open and that water underneath came out, the water coming up through the cracks, and the earth is obviously cracked up pretty bad, like an eggshell, all the fault lines all over the earth. That's where the water came shooting out that was underneath the earth. 
So that water, let's see. Oh, 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 DV9. Okay. The water underneath came shooting to the surface. That would make the surface rock collapse into the now the void, and it would condense, uh, contract, constrict, contract. I guess is the right word. The the mass of the Earth a little bit, causing the Earth to speed up in its spin. Like a diver when they dive, they tuck tighter, they spin faster. So the spin of the Earth probably changed. Probably the redistribution of the water and and material on the Earth because of Noah's flood would cause a lot of wobbling for who knows how long. Maybe it's still wobbling from that flood 4,400 years ago. So I think to, to say that they can look at a rock and see the magnetic pattern in the rock and determine the age of it is real stupid. I wouldn't believe that for one second. How do you know that rock hasn't moved? I know the whole crust of the earth hasn't moved two degrees or one degree or 10 degrees. And now they're measuring the magnetic pattern. Do the rocks capture the magnetic field and therefore it's, it's not changeable ever? How did they it, capture it to begin with? Is that a question for me? Or well, you I, just, no, I'm or saying you I don't believe I don't believe at all that they can tell the age of these rocks by the magnetic pattern in the rock. I don't believe that. Okay. Um, yeah, you probably don't have that. This isn't time for an open conversation to get that. But uh, thanks for your answer, regardless. Okay, Org, uh, appreciate it. Um, or I guess before we wind this down, in terms of the geologic column and uh, Kent's presentation uh, tonight, I'm not sure how much of it you caught, but I know you've caught previous debates. And yes. um, the, the the question in pertaining to the geologic column in terms of, you know, where would the new material come from and so on and so forth. Did you have a, a, a response or any thoughts on that, uh, Org? where new material would come from to create a geologic column. I think the classic answer is the recycling of the continents via plate tectonics, right? When the continents move, they if you get a divergent, or sorry, a convergent plate zone, one goes down, boils up, then it comes back up as magma and what have you, that creates new continents, it creates uh, uplift, stuff like that. So that's where the new material would come from. Is that answering your question? How does that change the age of it? You just moved it from here to here. You didn't change the age of it. Oh, yeah. You, the age of the rock is determined when it's placed, right? I don't know how old the original atoms are, but you can make a you can make an estimation about how old the rock was when it solidified for a volcanic or, you know, when it metamorphized or something like that. Well, if you want to date the age of a rock by when it's solidified, you're talking about magma or some kind of igneous sure. rock. Yeah. And but it, it, the geologic uh, Grand Canyon is nearly all sedimentary rock, and they've yes. given ages to all those layers, and it doesn't exist anywhere. That geologic column does not exist. It's crazy. So and even then, the only way I know, I'm aware that they try to date the sediment, the igneous rock or the metamorphic rock, is by uh, some kind of radioactive decay, carbon dating, potassium, argon, rubidium, strontium, lead 208, etc. All of those were invented in the last 50 years. And they were dating these rocks way before any of those were, you know, the geologic column was developed in 1830, 120 yeah. years before there was any carbon dating. How did they know the age then? Well, then, I don't know if the ages 130 years ago match the ages we have today, but I'm, you're, I'm sure you're well aware you got uh, relative age dating, you know, above and below Steno's laws and stuff like that um, to date those sort of things. How to date sedimentary rocks is a whole bunch of stuff in there, the crystals involved with it and stuff like that, uh, zircons, what have you. There's a whole lot to it. I'm not super up on all these conversations myself, but um, I know I was taught, obviously, that these things are accurate. And then when I went into my graduate research, I got to do some of the research in these topics, which solidified this case for me. That's kind of why I brought this in, because that's the research I did was on rock magnetics. And it's one of many things we have, right? You can, as you said, Kent, do radiocarbon dating. You can do uh, index fossils, which I know you <laughs> love so much. You can do uh, general stratigraphy. You can do paleo currents, right? There's a bunch of stuff. The fact that it all adds up and gives the same answers, respective of each other, um, I would argue solidifies the case. Okay. If you, if you have been taught that all those different methods give the same numbers, you have been brainwashed. That is not true. Let's schedule a whole debate just on that one. How do they determine the age of the layers? 
You give your evidence for why you think the layers are different ages. I would point out, is this top layer coming from outer space, or is it being arranged from someplace on Earth to another place on Earth? All the layers are the same age. All the material is the same age. What are you dating exactly? With carbon dating, aren't they dating the material in the layer? So I disagree completely, but that's for a whole other debate. I'd like to ask, again, we've, nobody's answered my question, how do you get petrified trees standing up, running through all the layers? They exist. Um, you, I can have a go at that if you want. Uh, you've heard sure. everything I say you've heard before, of course, but uh, petrified trees, similar to what we saw with Mount St. Helens, would be exactly what you, what we, let me restart that. We probably agree on how those petrified trees <laughs> um, got in their location, right? You would say Noah's flood. I would say some catastrophic event. The difference we have is you want the entire world to have the same catastrophic event. I have a localized catastrophic event. So these trees, you know, Mount St. Helens, when it exploded, all the trees floating vertically, collecting sediment, all of that jazz. That's the way I would say these things exist in nature. And I would go further and say the fact that they are very isolated, these sort of polystrate fossils, goes to show that it was not a worldwide event that caused all of them to happen simultaneously. Because how do you get certain trees in certain locations be polystrate and not every other tree all over the earth having the exact same deposition? That seems false to me, given that Noah's flood was one event that happened basically over the course of what, a month? Okay, so if we have all these polystrata fossils and each one is a localized event, you know it's a localized event because of the tree. But if there's layers that don't have any trees in them, could that also have been a rapid formation, a localized event that didn't happen to contain any trees? Floods are happening all the time. Go call Japan right now. They're having a tough time. Are they going to form any, are, are the trees, some of the trees are going to be knocked down. Some are going to be left standing and sediments buried around them. Sometimes trees are like Mount St. Helens blew thousands of trees into Spirit Lake. They floated around for a while. Many began floating in the upright position, floating, because the root end is heavier. They gradually settle down. I forget how many layers there are now at the bottom of Spirit Lake, but it's a lot. Those trees are going to petrify standing up, if they petrify at all, at the bottom of Spirit Lake from Mount St. Helens just 40 years ago. So if you see a tree that's standing up, you're saying that's a localized event. But how do you know an area that doesn't happen to have any of these is not also part of a worldwide flood? So uh, my response to that would be there's areas... Noah's flood would hit everything the exact same, right? And there's places that do not have polystrate trees that I'm sure would have had trees, right? I can say it's a localized event that made the polystrate trees because as you leave that area, you don't get polystrate trees anymore, right? Polystrate trees are small little sections of the rock record. So where there is no polystrate tree, that event that caused that formation obviously didn't happen. That doesn't mean there wasn't trees around there. Trees are not a rare thing. Trees are literally everywhere, except for what, deserts and Arctic climates. So if Noah's flood happened, it hit all trees simultaneously. How is Noah's flood making certain tiny little subsections of the planet polystrate and all the other trees throughout all the other world hit by the same event don't have this exact same deposition? That's a problem for me. Okay, watch any video of a flood taking place. And you will see the trees tend to lump together in log mats. And there might be a place where there's a massive river or a massive flood going. And there's millions of trees in one area and nothing in someplace else. It's all happening in one flood. The trees, they log, it's called a log jam. It happens all the time. So I think you'd have a real tough time proving that because there's no trees in some area, therefore, those are different ages than these where there are trees. So do you believe, oh. a, your, your answer to the polystrate fossils, if I understand, the reason we have these trees standing up petrified is because in a localized area, a whole lot of sediments formed rapidly enough to bury the tree. Some of them, I think, are 40 feet is the record. So 40 feet of sediments deposited before the tree could rot. Let's assume four, three, four, five years. Going through two coal layers. And your answer is, this is explainable by a localized event. My answer is all the strata in the world was formed by one event, Noah's flood. Could you prove that wrong? 
Well, I, I, I think it can. That's a whole huge conversation, right? You know that. But I think I, I, I have an issue with your answer in that polystrate trees are localized because of log jams. Like every tree in the world was destroyed by Noah's flood, basically. And then they all happen to, when the waters are seeded, make log jams in the places that we have polystrate trees. Like all the trees in the world, some of them happen to log jam in a certain way and all the other trees didn't. Well, I think during the flood of world of trees here. Well, during the flood of Noah, you get movement of massive amounts of water and wind. When you have a blizzard, you might get a snowdrift ten feet deep one place and bare ground showing thirty feet away. You, Donnie, you know about snowdrifts up there. So I think the same thing would happen with water or air. It moves material around, and they tend to accumulate in lumps or clumps or piles. And so the polystrate trees. Uh, they're found all over the world. Got them in Alabama, North Nova Scotia, Canada. Uh, I could, I probably should get a map showing all the places they've been found and reported. Sometimes they're found and can't, they won't be reported on because they go against the dumb religion of evolution. So yes, I think a flood is an easy explanation. Mount St. Helen, go to Google Mount St. Helens right now and re watch the video of what happened. It blew trees into Spirit Lake by the thousands and the wind would blow the trees to one end of the lake and then next month, they're at the other end of the lake. Huge log mats. Most of the lake is open, clear water. But the log mats are all together. One time they're at one end, sometime at the other end, and they petrify standing up. I think so I've got that, slides on. That, that, what you just said to me explains my case. If we look, if, you know, X number of years in the future, we go back, we find polystrate trees at Mount St. Helens, they're going to be clumped together in one isolated location because. All the tree, all the other trees didn't get polystrated, whatever the verb would be, right? So this localized event is going to push a small amount of stuff in one location, and that's why we find it that way. If the entire world underwent that same thing, I'm failing to see the connection here, right? Because right, I believe your model would have the continents moving as the waters recede. They're going down channels and all that, right? Grand Canyon was a channel for the receding Noah's flood water. If you can connect, if you can correlate these channels when Noah's flood went with the polystrate trees, maybe you'd have something. But I don't. Do you have that collection? Do you have? You said you need a map, right? Can you connect where you thought the floodwaters receded with the polystrate trees to make these log maps work? I'll have to work on that. Yes, that's a good good point. But again, the burden of proof is not on me to prove anything. The evolutionists only want their theory taught at taxpayer expense. They want you to teach the kids that all the layers are different ages when the evidence shows they had to form rapidly because of these trees. I just found my Mount St. Helens slides. I got 45,000 slides, so it would help if you'd ask the questions in the same order that I have the answers. Here we go. Here's the trees blown down by Mount St. Helens. Probably, I'll guess, a million. The rivers were log jammed with the trees floating away. There's the, the timber mill there, cutting the trees up. They hauled out logs by the thousands to try to save the usable wood. Mount St. Helens blew lots of trees. Mount St. Helens bottom center blew them into Spirit Lake. Here's the logs floating in Spirit Lake. They're still floating today, 42 years later, many of them. There's Mount St. Helens in the background. The log jams floated back and forth based upon the wind. Many logs began floating in the upright position. Here they are, picture of them floating upright in Spirit Lake right now. Go take a picture. Some floated flat, some sank flat, some sank vertical. And these trees, some are upside down. Some of the polystrata trees I show in my seminar are petrified standing up, upside down. Root end is up. How do you explain that as a localized event? I think it's insane to believe such a thing. It's much more common why, sense to believe all the why layers. Why would form. that have an issue with a localized event? I don't just You keep saying there's a problem with it being a localized event, but you're, I'm not hearing a reason why. You're giving an example of a localized event that produces polystrate trees and then following it with the sentence, you can't show that this was a localized event. How do you get a petrified tree upside down, running through layers in a localized event? Explain that. The tree flips over and continues to flow, gets waterlogged upside down. I mean, 
if the if the root if the root ball is destroyed, then the top of the tree would by definition be heavier because it's where the uh, branches are. So it would flip over. I mean, having the tree flip over is probably stuff that happens. Go through your pictures, you probably see some. Not all those trees the same orientation by a localized effect. Okay, if you chose to believe there was a worldwide flood and the Bible was true, would that affect your lifestyle or your uh, philosophy of life? I, I used to, and I would wager I'm not a very different person today. Okay. Well, let's have another debate, Donnie, and schedule ahead of time just on one topic, polystrata trees. How do they form? I'll gather more information. I've got friends who this is all they do is research on this, and they're loaded with, you know, their heads full of that. I, I try to be more of generic, overall general creation material. Let's give a little bit on the age of the earth, on dinosaurs, et cetera. I want to cover all the bases and let people specialize from there. But I'll get some of the specialty stuff together on that topic if you would like. But my, my position is it is much more logical to believe the reason we have trees standing up, petrified, running through these layers is all the layers formed in less than one year. Noah's flood would do that. All right, gentlemen, let me just jump in here uh, real quick. Org, I appreciate you joining. Uh, maybe it was meant to be that uh, the interlocutor for tonight did not show up because this has been a lot of fun. Kent, uh, apologies. You said you were ready for bed an hour ago, and we're now going on an hour and a half. Uh, so I do want to uh, thank all our guests for tonight for their questions, their engagement, objections, so on and so forth. So this really was a lot of fun. Org, thanks so much. Talking Trees, uh, Keith from earlier, and then also uh, James Booth.